Hey, Christina Tonnevold here, The Recovering Traditionalist, and I wanted to take a few minutes to chat about subitizing. Uh, if you don't know what subitizing is, it, first of all, it is the ability to tell how many without counting. It's instantly recognizing how many. So when you do this, and a kid has to sit there and count every single one of them, even if they're not physically touching your fingers, if they're like, you can see them nodding, they're still counting one by one to tell how many. Subitizing is when you hold this up, can a kid instantly tell you it's four? So subitizing, a quick way to do it is just with fingers. A lot of people also use dot patterns and the most simple dot patterns out there are things on a dice. So a simple tip for you is if you have any games that have spinners, for example, um, I'm thinking like shoots and ladders, comes with a spinner, but on the spinner, it's just the numerals. Well, those numerals don't really build a whole lot of number sense understanding for your kids. It's nice for them to recognize the digit five and all of that, but try switching it out for dice because then they can practice their subitizing while they're playing a game. So like, here's another simple activity you can do. This is a picture of my three-year-old and he was taking the number cards and lining them up from zero to five. And then he was using the savvy subitizing cards to match them up. So any card that had a one had to go in the line with the one. Any card that showed two got in the line with two. So those subitizing cards build such powerful understandings besides just the digit uh, of a number because the digit isn't really what a number is about. So if you play any card games with kids, another great way to bring in subitizing is to use savvy subitizing cards instead. Uh, and there's a link down below this video that takes you to where you can download them or buy a set that's pre-made for you that comes in a nice little deck. So if you're not currently doing subitizing activities, quick way is to just do small pieces of it. Like while kids are standing in line on the way to um, lunch or to PE, you can be flashing finger patterns at them and have them tell you how many. Uh, but I'm a big fan of games. And if you have centers, I have something for you. And you don't even have to do centers to have this, but if you want to include gameplay uh, during your math time, I have a thing called evergreen games. So evergreen games are games that you can use with any kind of content, because one of the hard parts of doing games is that once you do like you have to teach kids how to play a game. And then once you take the time to teach them how to play it, once they're tired of that game, then you gotta find a new game and teach them how to do that game and on and on and on. So it's just a lot of work to, to do games in a classroom and I understand that. So evergreen games are games that you teach the idea of the game once and then you can switch out the content. So like memory. Memory is a common game that we all know how to play. You don't even have, like as soon as people say memory, most of us know the general idea of memory. It's just what are we gonna do in memory? So memory, you've got cards laid uh, face down and then you flip over two cards to see if they match. So uh, when kids are really little, that starts with like just matching um, pictures but then it starts turning into maybe matching uppercase letters to lowercase letters. Well, memory can also be used in math. So here's an example of some cards from the download that's available with this blog post. Uh, I'm not gonna put them all out here, but there's a bunch of cards that go together and normally you would have these face down, but the idea is to then find matches of a wreck and wreck, which are these, if you're not familiar with a wreck and wreck, uh, to the 10 frame, because 10 frames are also a great visual for subitizing, as are wreck and wrecks or math racks. So there's a bunch of cards here and you can lay them all down. And the idea of memory is that you would have them laid over and then they have to flip them over and try to find two that match. But just to give you the sense of this, like these two would match together uh, if they were flipped over. So. Once you teach kids, the general idea of memory is that you're trying to find two cards that match. You could really switch that out for any uh, visuals that you want to do inside the game of memory. And then the nice part about these little cards, these are meant for like small groups, is that all of those little cards will go into a nice little snack size uh, baggie that you can have in some bins somewhere or file folders, however you do your games. Another game that is pretty much an evergreen game that you might be familiar with is the game I Have Who Has. 
So basically, uh, the kids have all of these cards, and these are meant for a small group. So there's six of these cards. And pretty much any one of these cards could start. If you want to determine one that is the starting, you could put a little sticker on it. So the kids would have, each kid would have one of these. And let's just say this kid is the one who starts. So this kid says, I have four. Who has and then they have to figure out what is on their tent frame there. So they would say, I have, I have four, who has seven? And then we wait to fig for the kid who has the one who it is, I have seven. Let's see where that's at. I have seven. And then they say, who has nine? And then it just keeps going around. And then eventually it should come all the way back to the person who started who said, I have four. So one of the last ones will be this card right here who says, who has four? and then it comes back around. So this is meant for a small group setting and in the download you'll get a couple examples of this. Another popular game here recently has become Bump. Uh, so Bump, this is a version that you are rolling a die. So you're playing with a partner, one person rolls the die, they get four. So basically all it is is taking that visual of the dot pattern on the dice and transferring it to what it looks like uh, and being able to summatize that in a 10 frame. So once they roll the four, whoever rolled that four then gets to place a marker on the one that has four. Now if you don't have a bunch of manipulatives, just give your kids two different colored markers and uh, this is in a uh, sheet protector so they're able to wipe it off really easily. So they mark their four. Uh, and then they're rolling and their partner rolls and so they got a six. So their partner rolls and marks the six. And they keep doing this, uh, the five, three, four, five, five, six. Okay, so in this one, the blue person got a six, but somebody's already on the six. So they get to bump that person off and replace it with their marker. And then it keeps going like that all the way through the game. And on this one, child with the blue marker has two marks on the five. So even if the child with the black marker gets a five, they can't bump them off. So the goal is to try to get as many of them with your two marks uh, as possible. So you keep playing until all of them have two marks uh, and then you can see who has the most marks. That's one version to play in. If you have actual manipulatives, you can give each kid eight manipulatives and then as soon as they have their eight manipulatives out there co covering spots, um, then the game is over. So there's different variations of how you play it, uh, but that's the general uh, gist of the game. Uh, for bump. But the cool part is once kids learn bump, you can really trade out what is in these spots or even trade what they do with it. So instead of just dice to 10 frame, it could be matched to, to make 10. So if I roll a six, what I would actually put my mark on is the four because the six and four go together to make 10. So it could be a make 10 bump. So you, you can modify what they're actually doing within the game, but the rules of the game don't change. And that's one of the things that I love about these evergreen games. Another evergreen game is Capture 4. So it's kind of like bingo, but you're playing on the same game board. And I have kids play on the same game board because it makes them have to ha use some strategy while they're playing the game. So in this version, we are rolling a die and then taking the whatever amount is on the die and finding the version of the math rack that matches it. So I rolled a one, and again, they would have different colored markers. So I could ca capture that one, but they didn't necessarily have to do that one. There's also one here and here. So they have to think strategically as they start playing the game to, to decide which one they wanna capture. Because the goal is to get four spots in a row captured. And that can be diagonally, it can be horizontally, it can be vertically. So they, they can use different ones. Um, that are on the board, but the same amount. They just have to look strategically. So <clears throat> again, they keep going. Um, and let's say right here, a child who did four, uh, he 
or she could do four clear over here, but if they wanna think strategically, right? Think about, oh, I could do a four right here because then it blocks my partner and now they can't get four in a row going that way. So, so the general idea of capture four is they have to capture four spots, but what, how they capture those four spots could change, right? I could, again, roll the dice and make 10 to be able to capture whatever it is. I could roll the dice and add 10 to it. Uh, you can modify the game to be based upon what the kids are working on at the time, but the general rule of that game is that you wanna capture four in a row. The last evergreen game is called Difference Two. Uh, and so basically, you just decide what the kids are finding the difference to. It could be the difference to five, it could be a difference to 10, it could be a difference to 100. As you're working with fractions, it could be difference to a half, difference to the whole. Um, and so this version, we're just gonna roll one die, uh, and then they color in that amount on their tin frame, and then they have to find the difference to and then you can put whatever you want. So you really just get to decide what you want them to have the difference to. It can be five, it could be 10. You could even do six, seven, eight. It doesn't really matter on this one. Um, so let's say I'm working with some smaller kids. I want them to find the difference to five. So they roll, player one rolls, and then they color in the amount that they rolled. Player two rolls, and they got five. And then they have to think about who was closest to the five. So in this case, player two got exactly five, but player one was one over five. So who the child that had the smallest difference um, is the winner. And then they scrape it off and then they keep playing. There, You can create a sheet for them to keep track of with older kids uh, who had uh, what the difference. You could create a sheet for different kids that has a little list that they keep for each round of like player one would have had a difference of one, player two had a difference of zero, and then they can tally it up at the end to see who was the overall winner from all the rounds that they played. So I just wanna encourage you that if you haven't been doing subitizing, it is as easy as just doing some finger patterns with kids and helping them see that three doesn't always have to be this or this. Three can be like this. We want them to see it in lots of different ways so that they aren't tied to just one way to see an amount. Um, and it can be just by doing finger patterns, dot patterns, but if you wanna get kids playing games while you're doing it, because I love letting kids play games, then there is a download that you can request that has all of these games that I just played along with another example of each of those games. So have a great day, keep building those math minds and keep subitizing.